All right, students, let's talk about organic compounds. Here's the essential question. How can we represent carbon-based molecules? Well, before we get into that, I want to talk about branches of chemistry. At the very beginning in Chem 1, we learned that chemistry is the study of matter and how matter changes. Now, there's lots of branches of chemistry that study matter in various ways. In chemistry in high school, we mostly focus on inorganic chemistry, but we're going to switch gears a little bit and focus on organic chemistry, another very important branch of chemistry. Well, what is organic chemistry? You might have heard the word organic used in various scenarios, maybe in the food that you eat or in living things. And in fact, chemistry used to be derived from, organic chemistry used to be derived from the chemistry of living things. We've since learned that many of the, the chemistry in living things are carbon-containing compounds, and even non-living things contain these as well. The study of plastics or fuels are examples of organic chemistry because they are, they are structures, properties, compositions, reactions, and how to prepare carbon-containing compounds. This is an example of an organic compound. You probably remember covalent bonds. Organic compounds are covalently bonded carbon atoms. This is a hydrocarbon. It's the simplest form of an organic compound that contains only carbon and hydrogen. Carbon as we stated before, is the backbone of organic chemistry. It's so versatile. And the reason for that is because if you take a look at its electron dot structure in the lower left-hand corner, it has four valence electrons and can make four bonds with other elements and itself, which is very unique. And you can see the various for formulas and structures that carbon can make being the backbone of many organic compounds. Speaking of organic structures, let's take a look at the various organic structural models. Let's start with the upper left-hand corner. This is a chemical formula. This is the symbols and how many elements are within, are bonded together within that molecule. So in this C4H10, this is butane, by the way. We can represent butane using the electron dot structure, as you see in the lower left-hand corner. This shows all the valence electrons and how these valence electrons are interacting with various elements to create bonds. Chemists like to simplify those bonds. This is a structural formula over on the right-hand side. Instead of drawing all the dots, we can simplify two electron bonds with these single bonds or single lines represented here in the structural formula of butane on the right, on the lower right. Now, sometimes we take a chemical formula and we want to break it up a little bit bigger to show a little bit more stuff. This is the condensed formula. I know it's not as condensed as the chemical formula, but it shows all the various carbons and the backbone chain of this organic molecule because carbon is so important. There's even more models that we should know as well. The first one up in the upper left-hand corner is the ball and stick model. This represents molecules like butane in a three-dimensional structure. We typically use balls and sticks in real life as well when we use organic model kits, as you've probably done in chemistry class. We can also represent 3D three-dimensional structures in two dimensions, such as here in the lower left-hand corner. This is very similar to the structural formula, but you might notice that the lines that are straight are in line with the page, kind of like this hydrogen bond right here. The dashed lines are the ones going into the page. Look at this hydrogen in the very back right here. That represents this hydrogen going into the page in three dimensions. The one that's a wedge or a wedged line are the bonds that are coming out of the page. Kind of like this hydrogen right here is coming out of the page. This hydrogen is also coming out of the page. So we could represent three-dimensional structures in two dimensions by using lines, dashed lines, and wedged lines. Another very important structure in organic chemistry is the skeletal structure, and this is butane as well, just like the other two. And it's very simplified. Oftentimes when we draw really long hydrocarbons, we kind of condense a lot of things down. The first thing to notice is that all of the edges and all of the bent bonds are carbons. That's where all the carbons are. So we don't write out carbon, we just represent the carbon backbone using the different angled edges. One thing also that's not drawn are all the hydrogens. Hydrogen often bonds to carbon. So anytime carbon is left with less than four bonds, we know that there are some implied hydrogens there. 
Now, before we move on, I also want to talk about isomers. Isomers are organic compounds that have similar or the same, the exact same molecular formula, but different structures. All of these are various forms of C4H10. Now, that doesn't mean that all of these forms are the same. In fact, notice that this isobutane and butane here have very different looking structures. And in fact, their chemical and physical properties are often different as well. So that's something to be aware of in organic chemistry when we model organic compounds. Other things to know about in organic chemicals and models is heteroatoms. Heteroatoms are any of the atoms that are not carbon or hydrogen. We have to write these atoms in the skeletal structure um, because we can't be lazy about those. In order to help us understand structures a little bit better and those heteroatoms, one good rule to remember is the Hunk 1, 2, 3, 4 rule. These represent how many different bonds common not common elements make in organic compounds. Let's start with hydrogen. Hydrogen typically likes to make one bond. This hydrogen, for example, is making a single bond with this oxygen. And these two hydrogens, like mice, are each making single bonds with that nitrogen. Oxygen likes to make two bonds. Take a look at this oxygen right here. There is a double bond going to this carbon at this bend right here. That is an example of that. Even this oxygen right here likes to make two single bonds. So oxygen likes to make two bonds. Nitrogen typically likes to make three bonds. This nitrogen is bonded to a carbon here, and it's also bonded to two separate hydrogens over on the left-hand side. Finally, carbon, as we stated before, often makes four bonds. This carbon right here is making two obvious bonds, one with this nitrogen and another with this carbon, but there's also two implied hydrogens here that are not written. This carbon is making four bonds as well, two with the oxygens above it, one with the carbon to the left, and one with the oxygen to the right. All right, here is a practice problem, a very complicated one at that. This is a structural formula, a skeletal formula of an organic compound. How many carbon atoms are there? Pause the video right now and see if you can figure it out yourself. All right, did you pause it? Here, let me help you out if you're struggling. I'm gonna circle all of the different bends that where carbons are at. Hopefully you can count that there are 13 carbons in this organic molecule. All right, second question, how many hydrogen atoms are there? All right, let's see if you can figure this one out or if you figured it out yourself. I'm gonna go ahead and draw the hydrogens that are implied and not drawn. Those are where all the carbons have less than four obvious bonds, um, as well as highlight the ones that are written with the other heteroatoms. You should be able to count 18 hydrogen atoms in this molecule. Now, if we add the other two, elements, the other heteroatoms, nitrogen, there are two of them, and oxygen, there are five of them, we can get a whole compound formula. By the way, this organic molecule is aspartame. Now, organic molecules, speaking of names, have common names and systematic names. Many of the common names are derived from names that a molecule had when it was first discovered, and they didn't have systematic names back then. For example, ammonia is an example of a name that happened from ancient Egypt because this ammonia itself was a com compound often used in Egyptian uh, rites. Now, ammonia's systematic name is nitrogen trihydride. The systematic name helps us understand what the chemical structure is. Specifically, ammonia is made of one nitrogen and three hydrogens. And it's international. It's used internationally. Another common name would be brimstone, and a systematic name would be sulfur. That's just an element. Now, a couple more complicated ones are acetone and aspartame. Acetone is fingernail polish remover, and we typically call it 2-propanone. Now, the 2-propanone seems a little bit more complicated than acetone, but that name itself helps us understand what the molecular structure is. Same with aspartame. If you look at the bottom right, this really complicated name over here is a systematic name that helps us be able to draw and redraw aspartame systematically based on the name and where different groups are, where the elements, where the carbons and other heteroatoms exist. Now, you aren't going to have to know how to name organic molecules. You should just be aware that there are common names and systematic names. 
The last thing I want to talk about is how we know what organic molecules are made out of. They seem very complicated and some of them seem close but different. Well, these two experiments, mass spectrometry and IR spectroscopy, are both experiments that they do to be able to, to determine what an organic molecule is is made out of. Mass spectrometry, as you see on the left, just breaks apart the molecule based on its various masses of the various chunks. And then IR spectroscopy uses light and how light interacts with the molecule. Often these are used in things like crime scene investigations to determine what a molecule, organic molecule is made out of, such as DNA. All right, that's the end of our notes. Take a moment to review things and good luck.